Hello once again, everybody, and welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you. Got a little poll here I want to take. How many of you care about the little visual gags and humor that I throw in here? Because uh, I'll admit, one of the reasons I keep putting off recording is because I'm really lazy, <laughs> and I know that I'll have to figure out things to put in there and search for them and throw them in and do all this editing and blah, 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 blah. And I'm wondering, do most of you appreciate those, or do most of you just watch it while you're over on Amazon searching? for Realms books or whatever. Because if it's the latter, then I feel like, well, it's silly, and I'll just put up, you know, a picture of the book that I'm talking about through the entire discussion, and that's it. End of story. I don't really know how much they add. It, it, it seems to me like I was going through some of my stuff recently to see what I thought about it, and I was like, you know, it's cute, but it doesn't really have much replay value. It's more just me talking about stuff that really, I hope, has the replay value least what I would be listening to. I was pretty quickly searching through <coughs> Amazon <laughs> or what have you rather than listening to the or uh, watching the entire spiel. But if everybody likes that stuff the most then then I'll keep doing it. For this one I think I'll try just throwing up a uh, because maybe you're like me with a lot of things and you're like oh boy I never even realized do I care or not. So I think maybe for this one I'll just try uh, throwing up the shots of the book covers and uh, the Realms logo and have that be about it, uh, really, and see how that goes, see if anybody cares one way or the other. Let's start out with books that we are skipping. 1366, King Pinch. Did not get very far in this at all. Just really didn't care for it one way or the other. It starts out with like some thieves, one of them's named Pinch. So I'm assuming they were going to either do like a Prince and the Popper sort of thing, or it would just get to the point where Pinch became the king. I don't know. It it just didn't seem very well written to me, and I couldn't get into it, and I didn't figure it was worth, worth wasting my time on it. Soldiers of Ice, same year. Also could not get into it. Had a fun sort of idea for its adventure, which was that there was an ice volcano up north. <laughs> and I was like, that's cool. That's I'm pretty sure that's been a Doctor Who episode at some point or another. And, and that just sounded cool, but it was really not very well written and just not worth uh, wasting the time on to read it, to try to get to that ice volcano, and who knows, you know, that could have been a, uh, a mislead, for all I know. Though it is Soldiers of Ice, so assumedly there's some ice in it. Skipping back to 1364, Passage to Dawn. So I really thought this was going to be it, you know, I, I laid down the law uh, as far as skimming things goes, just, you know, I'm not going to put up with that anymore, I'm just going to, if I don't like a book, just tossing it out, going to be much harsher on things now, and I'm going to, and I really do plan to stick with that, as you can see, I mean, I can't even tell you much about those two books, I made it so very short of a way into them. So I thought, this is it, this is going to be the last Triz book that I even attempt to read, because it's going to you know, be the usual crap, and I'm not going to care, and I'm going to toss it to the side. Then I was shocked and amazed and pleasantly surprised that I actually dug Passage to Dawn overall. Granted, the second act is kind of weak, but the first act was decently interesting enough, because I was just like, if it's the same old this, 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 or this, then I'm going to get really tired of it, and it starts out totally different. It's Drizzt and Cadbury on the sea sprite, like, hunting down pirates, and they come across something, and they think that it's related to, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now, but it's related to the, uh, the captain rather than Driz's past. And I was like, holy crap, like, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Like, something that isn't just, like, all the annoying people from Menza Baranzen or Artemis and Trary trying to take down Driz again. Wouldn't that be a nice, interesting plot? And, uh, of course, then in Act 2, we find out, well, we really find out in the prologue, though, since they've been kind of teasing with this for a while. I say they, I don't know why. When it's a shared universe, I always say they, even though this is obviously Salvatore's baby. I mean, I'm sure his editor, who I believe by this point was Athens, though I could be wrong, I believe his editor probably, you know, has some input and everything, but for the most part, I'm sure this was Salvatore's idea, but just ignore if I say they, it doesn't really mean anything. It's not like I have a conspiracy theory. So the, it is set up in the uh, prologue, but as I say, the, the Air 2 slash Wolfgar stuff has been teased enough at this point that um, I don't necessarily think that you're thinking this is what we're going to see played through until it's really just given away towards the beginning of Act 2 and it's like, yes, okay, this is all about Drizzt again. It is his fault. This is a trap being laid for him. la di da di da And they have to go deal with it. But by that point, I actually was interested in the book and had enough fun with it. And yeah, I skimmed a lot during Act 2. But it was still enjoyable, way more enjoyable than any other Drizzt book, except maybe the Time of Troubles one. But even that, it was like, what, one book out of five, I think, that I actually liked? This is the book where I actually had to stop reading the audiobooks because the audiobooks at least a large portion of them, are read by this just horrible reader who seems to think 
everything is sarcastic. I mean, he'll just read any sort of line with this creepy, sarcastic bend to it, like, Driz saw the sun rising in the east. Like, said as if there's some hidden joke we're supposed to get there, and it's like, dude, there's no joke. The sun is rising. Stop acting as if everything is tongue-in-cheek. Horrible, horrible reading, and I don't know why they kept casting this person. I'm assuming they just didn't care about the audiobooks or whatever. But the overwriting is way less noticeable here. My only main problem with it is the fact that uh, Drizden Company once they kind of figure out what's going on, believe that they are going to rescue Zach Nathan. That Air 2 or some horrible demon spawn has Zach Nathan's soul, and they're going to rescue him. And then the ending, they find out it's Wolfgar. So it's like it's both a win and a loss. And I thought that was a nice touch, except for the fact that from the prologue on, we know that it's Wolfgar that they're saving. So the irony is purely dramatic irony rather than um, a twist for the readers. And I was like, that would have been a really cool twist. Like, for instance, there's this one bit in there that I love during the climax where Drizzt is fighting some huge bad guy, and it's like, I think they're fighting demons all at the end. Anyway, he's fighting this uh, character, and, and the demon, I think, can, like, kind of read his mind, and he sees that he thinks that he's fighting for Zach Nathan's soul. So the demon uses this ploy of being like, son, this is your father. I, he, Ertu has put me in this body and forced me to fight you so that you're gonna kill me and then you're gonna feel bad about it. So it forces Driz to like hold back because he's like, oh shit, it's my dad and I'm really upset and oh my god. And I was like, that's really cool. Like that's such a, a, a mind screw over. Uh, that, that's such a great way to fight Driz. If you realize that he's an awesome fighter, be like, I have to trick him, you know? I'm going to use everything under my power to do that. So I really, really enjoyed that. Then, of course, they get Wolfgar back, and it ends on this incredibly happy note, with him back and everybody's happy again. Da, 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 da. So going into Silent Blade, which is the same year, 1364, I thought, uh, now we're going to get back to the way everything was before. It's all going to be exactly like it was before. It's going to be boring. Nothing's going to happen here. But, again, pleasantly surprised happy to be pleasantly surprised because I want to like this stuff, obviously. The Silent Blade is really good. Like, it has this, like, if we've been kind of Saturday morning cartoon up to this point, this makes it kind of push into Buffy level territory. Now we're doing kind of ongoing adventures and it's more Buffy style. We have a little more introspection, a little more adult view on things. I know that's weird because Buffy is like a show about teenagers, but uh, you know what I mean? Like that, that sort of more adult take on things, even if it's a teenager's life. Um, obviously, this isn't about teenagers, but you, you get what I'm saying, I hope. It starts off with, uh, like, I think book one is called Apathy, and it's basically, with this book, we start following a bunch of different plot lines, which I think works really well, and it causes Salvatore to get more concise because he has a lot more that he's trying to tell uh, in a story. We have Artemis and Trary return to Calumport. And with Artemis and Trary's, like, first fight once he gets back, because basically there's somebody who's like, hey, dickweed, because they're new and they don't know him, and he's been gone for, like, five years. And so he has to, like, take them down. And I was like, holy crap, Salvatore can write action scenes. He can write fights really well. I've never seen it up to this point, because it's always just Driz bringing those damn scimitars down in a slashing motion, and that's it. That's, like, all he ever does. All anybody ever does, Cadbury looses her bow with ferocity and blah, 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 blah. And then all the dwarves are ridiculous and flying all over the place and everything. I've never seen him write a good action scene, but this one, the action scenes are incredibly readable, fast-paced, dynamic, really, really good stuff. So in Trary's back to Calumport, and he just, he's like, he doesn't care anymore about anything. He he has no purpose in life. He has no direction. He can't focus. He can, he can do everything that he's really good at, but he really doesn't care about it anymore. The Dark Elves come to uh, Calumport because basically Jarlaxle sees a chance to make money off of being in the surface world. So he and a couple of buddies are there. They come back. So that's one big subplot going on is, is everything in Calumport. Then there's Wolfgar coming back, and I was so happy slash sad to see this happen. Happy because it makes sense, and it's far more interesting. Sad because, you know, I don't hate Wolfgar. I don't want to see him suffer. But Wolfgar is just, I, I mean, the emotional sort of scars that he's had to deal with from being in the abyss for so long are rough, and they affect him badly. And there's this scene that I was so shocked by, because it's so 
adult and over the top for the realms. Basically, Cadbury like comforts him with sex, even though she doesn't really feel like it. But she's like, you know, we were that close once, and we might be again. And he needs this right now, so she comforts him with sex. And afterwards, as he's kind of reclining, he starts getting PTSD and thinking, "Oh my God, it's another trick! It's another trick!" So he just wallops the shit out of her. So she's left bleeding. Postcoital. I mean, imagine this. This is harsh stuff, man. This is intense. Like, she's there, you know, still fresh from the experience and bleeding now. And Wolfgar runs off into the night. So you have Drizzt reaching out to him and trying to, like, draw him back through battle. Cadbury trying to draw him back through sex. Just a, a lot of different things. And all of it's failing, and Wolfgar cannot fit back into humanity. So he runs off and becomes a bouncer in uh, Luskin, I think. Which, I'll admit, I skimmed his bits most of all because I just don't really care that much. But still, I loved the idea of it. I loved the progression of it. Basically, those are the two main plots. I don't even remember what Drizzt, Cadbury, Regis, and uh, Bruno are doing. They're just kind of hanging out and going somewhere, I think. Oh, they're having this whole huge thing. They're going to try to get to Catterley to destroy the Crystal Shard. That's what it is. That's, the, uh, that's their plot. And then that intersects with... And Trary and Jarlaxle and all of them in this big climax, which I thought was really cool because it started out like, oh god, here we go again, because it's Entrary versus Driz, but basically Jarlaxle, who kinda takes a shine to Entrary, is like, you know, the thing is you've never beaten Drizzt and you've never been beaten by Drizzt. You guys are exact opponents. You have to solve this one way or the other to get through your life. So he sets it up, he makes it happen so that uh Entrary fights Drizzt. And they have this big, big fight, and in the end, I mean, of course, it's it just goes on forever, and they're evenly matched, and there's no winner, and blah, 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 blah. So, Jarlaxle has his, like, psionic right-hand guy kill Driz, takes him out, and he's like, look, there, it's done. You know, one way or the other, whether it was fair or not, you won. The end. Stop whining, because you're awesome. And Entreri's basically like, you know, well, hell, I guess I have to kind of accept that, you know? And so he goes along with it. Of course, Jarlaxle doesn't actually kill Drizzt, because what the hell would the other Drizzt books be about, right? But he fakes it because he's like, I gotta snap Entreri out of this, and Drizzt is just some jackass. What the hell do I care about him, you know? Um, all he's doing is getting in the way. We do this, Entreri doesn't worry about him anymore, and Entreri can focus on doing stuff for me. We're all good. Which, again, I just love, because Jarlaxle comes at everything from such lateral thinking uh, point of view, and I really, really like that, because so many people in these books are either good or evil, you know what I mean? Like, like to see a character like Jarlaxle is really refre refreshing and so much fun. So then in the end, Entreri, in his own way, which I, again, really love this subplot. It was kind of obvious where it was going, but I, that's okay. I, I, I don't mind obvious if it makes sense. Resolves his issues in a couple of personal ways, and things end on an up note kind of for him. So he stays in Kalimpur with the Dark Elves working on uh, taking over Kalimpur. Drizzt and his company, oh, uh, with the uh, Crystal Shard. Um, that's like Jarlaxle's kind of thing, is like, I give you your life in exchange for the Crystal Shard. So he keeps that. Drizzt and his company go, I don't know what they do, since they uh, don't have the Crystal Shard to destroy anymore. I'm not really sure where they're going. I guess that'll come up in book four of this series. Uh, the final Legend of Drizzt book. Holy crap, it feels like you know, <laughs> we'll get there some someday, man. The one thing I do for certain remember happening at the end of the book with Drizzt and his group is that Drizzt starts becoming a stalker. There's this great quote, The ranger alternated his looks between Cadbury, how he loved to gaze upon her when she wasn't looking. <laughs> like, how creepy does that sound? I mean, women out there. If you had the chance to, like, read somebody's journal, I don't care how hot he is, and it's like, Oh, how I love to gaze upon her when she doesn't notice I'm looking. How creepy would that be? Seriously. Anyway. And uh, Wolfgar is staying in Luskin, where actually the Dark Elves are keeping an eye on him because Jarlaxle realizes that Wolfgar could be something he could hold over Driz's head if the whole Driz thing ever comes to bite him in the ass. Which, again, I just thought made so much sense and I really, really enjoyed. So it just, it, it, it really felt like all of the kind of soap opera stuff Salvatore had been trying to do and not doing an amazing job at along the way so far really culminated here. This just felt like such a great novel. As I say, I skipped most of the Wolfgar stuff, but still, that's maybe 15% of the novel overall, and I did like the direction of it. So this is a really, really good book. The only kind of down note is I read through book one and I was really enjoying it, and then I picked up Glenn Cook's White Rose, 
because I had read book two of that trilogy and really enjoyed it recently, and so I was like, oh, I gotta go ahead and finish this off. Why is a long story and it doesn't matter? But I picked it up and I finished it off. And that book is all about people who feel apathy and feel old and feel beyond their prime, but Glenn Cook does it about 80 times better than Salvatore. <laughs> it's all done much more subtly and much more effectively. So it was kind of like that, that put a little bit of a damper on this, but that's okay. I mean, you can have a really, really, really well done children's show and it might not be as enjoyable to watch as a really well done show like Buffy, you know? But that doesn't make the children's show bad. Does that, I hope that makes sense. And that's how I felt about this. It was still really, really good. It just wasn't, say, aiming as high as White Rose. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with knowing the book that you want to write. This is not a book meant solely for adults. This is a book meant for maybe not all ages, but a wider array of ages, but it's still written so much better than any of the stuff that came before. So does my enjoyment of the Driz series continue after this? Well, you'll find out uh, next time, because I will talk about whether I skipped the next one or read it and what I thought of it. But for now, I've talked for a very long time, so I'm going to let you go. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.